I'm Vincent Manicourt from the UK. I'm Catherine I. Oreo from the US. I'm Eugenie Lambert from France. I'm Lara Fernandez from Russia. I am Federica Marci from Syria. Hello and welcome to 20 Minutes. In this week's report, we're looking at different countries' coverage of Syria at the end of August and the first week of September. We investigated how the world powers' decision to intervene or not affected the lives and deaths of Syrians as well as the journalists covering the conflict. We looked at the US, France, Russia, Britain and Syria itself. While some of these countries had little on the ground reporting during this time, a lot of their coverage was concerned with the political situation back home. First up, let's go to New York. I'm Catherine I. Oreo from the US. Where reporting from Syria is becoming more and more dangerous for journalists. After looking at key media reports from ABC News, NBC and CNN, it is evident that networks are putting their own journalists' lives at risk in order to obtain these stories, but not all. ABC News used citizen journalists where they were given cameras from the network and then asked to document their daily lives. Most of the first-hand reporting for ABC was done so by citizen journalists. Chief Foreign Correspondent Terry Moran and Middle East Correspondent Alexander Marquette contributed from the nearby city of Beirut. In ABC's special Caught in the Crossfire, citizen journalists filmed most of the footage and then smuggled it over the border. Take for instance the Caught in the Crossfire Armed and Dangerous, where the volunteer female teachers are trained rebel snipers patrolling their neighborhood in order to keep it safe. This report provides a glimpse of the war-torn country that never would have been seen had it not been for citizen journalists. This story and others could not be told without the footage and resources by citizen journalists. But on the other hand, networks like NBC tries to get their journalists on the ground, only to have them kidnapped. An unknown militia group held NBC chief correspondent Richard Engel and his four-man team held captive for five days while they were attempting to go into Syria. Unlike ABC and NBC, CNN's senior international correspondent Nick Patton Walsh reported from the front line of Syria. He states, people didn't really know where the front lines were. He calls it chaotic and punctuated all day long with the sounds of shelling or jets flying in to hit civilian areas. For those networks, sending journalists to the front line, they are witnessing firsthand the life and death of Syrians. By bringing these stories to life, journalists are also putting their own lives at risk. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, five journalists were killed while covering Syria. UK journalist for Vice, Hannah Smith, has been covering Syria since February. I caught up with her while she was still on assignment in Syria. Let's take a look because Syria being what it is, you need to have good contacts with the brigades, with the FSA brigades, with the Kurdish brigades, with whatever area you're in, in order to be safe, in order not to be kidnapped, um, in order to not be arrested, all these kind of things. But then the problem is that if you're working with a fixer who's affiliated to one of these brigades, they become very unwilling to help you do stories which might be critical of those brigades. Um, you know, and myself and my colleagues, we've had problems with fixes not translating things properly for us, with keeping information from us, all those kind of things. It's not so much a question of bias. My main problem is that, that what journalists tend to do, and you know, there, there are various reasons for this, is to oversimplify situations. So Syria is incredibly complex. It's, you know, it's not a civil war between one side and another, or between you know the good guys and the bad guys. It's, it's not how it is. You've got loads of different factions, loads of different front lines, loads of different ideologies. But when you're a journalist, what you have to do is try and simplify very complex situations down so that your average person can understand them and wants to keep reading. And the problem with that is that, you know, when it comes to Syria, we, we have to use shorthands, um, you know, for FSA regime. And, you know, based on the yeah, I would argue there's no such thing as the FSA. What you've got is just a group of separate brigades. Some of them are pro-Western, some of them are Islamist, some of them are funded by the Muslim Brotherhood, some of them are just criminals. I came out of Aleppo on the 5th of August and then literally on the 6th or 7th, like three journalists were kidnapped in one day. And so that actually happened when hardly anyone was inside. I'm Vincent Manancourt from Great Britain. 
This is the week the British government lost a vote in Parliament to intervene in Syria. According to The Telegraph, this was, this was an embarrassing blow which could trigger a leadership crisis for Cameron. So the focus of this piece is very much on the effect the outcome might have on the political situation in Britain rather than the lives of Syrians. The reaction to the vote by re reporters on the ground in Syria was strong. Anthony Lloyd wrote a piece for The Times entitled How Can My England Ignore These Horrors? Talking about a Syrian he knew who had been gassed with siren, he said, How different is his experience of life and death from that of Sarah Wallace's constituents in their Dumpling Hill homeland, a place where the gassing of nearly 1,300 people in Damascus last week slides smoothly across the village church steeples of South Hams and on out of sight. I caught up with Anthony to ask him about the difficulties of covering Syria for a British audience and on how the outcome of the vote would affect the way he worked as a British journalist in Syria. The vote ended any further speculation about Britain's potential involvement in intervention in Syria. It therefore finished, or diminished, many people's interest in the Syrian story. They became tired of the unending horror that was Syria. Personally, I don't think the vote hugely affected the way I was able to cover Syria, which was already hugely challenged by the spread of Al-Qaeda and criminal groups. Ultimately, the extreme risk of abduction halted my assignments to Syria, for the time being at least. This risk evolved separately to the parliamentary vote. I'm Eugenie Lambert from France. Our president François Hollande stands firm on his decision to intervene in Syria. Left-wing media decided to support the president's decision, whereas right-wing media underlined the backlashes of a potential intervention. Let's take a closer look into newspapers in France. The majority of French newspapers didn't use their correspondence in Syria because the situation was becoming far too dangerous on that week. Therefore, most of the reports from Syria are coming from press agencies such as AFP, AP and Reuters. Le Nouvel Observateur, for example, is a left-wing paper which decided to cover the position of the president, François Hollande, but also describes Obama as an authoritarian regulator. Their article on Syria, The Worst Strategy, mostly relies on MSF or expert analysis based in France. They also express their reluctance against the interview given by Bashar al-Assad to Le Figaro, in which he warns France regarding its position. This controversial interview was actually the only one to cover both the situation in Syria and François Hollande's decision. The interview was led in Damascus on September 2nd by Georges Malbruno, a French journalist who is specialized in the Middle East. In the interview, El Assad commented on our president's decision by saying, I believe that the French government is working against the interest and will of its people. In fact, he clearly warned France on the repercussions of its involvement in the crisis and strongly denied the use of chemical weapons. François Hollande himself reacted to this interview by thanking ironically Le Figaro for its saving sense by enlightening French people's opinion with a dictator interview. Georges Malbruno took us behind the scenes of this interview. I originally asked for an interview with Bashar al-Assad in December 2011. I chose to interview him because he's the president of Syria, the head of the regime. I was in Damascus and I go there every six months since I was allowed again to fly to Syria. And the news were where the regime was. That's why this interview had such a great impact. The regime wanted to communicate a lot, so I went to a zone under control and it wasn't too difficult for me. But trusting your contacts has always been an issue when covering the Syrian conflict. Each side wants to show the reality the way they see it. And that's propaganda in a way. You know, you have to count on luck when you're a journalist. Sometimes you're not lucky and there's nothing you can do about it. Le Nouvel Observateur, Le Monde and Libération really got it wrong on the situation in Syria. They were doing militancy and they thought that the regime was going to fall. But I have witnessed how strong it actually remained. And I believe that when informing, you need to make sure that you're not supporting one side. I think it's a shame. In France, newspapers need to sort out their issue with militancy and not reveal their emotions. I'm Lara Fernandez from Russia. Putin's government decided not to intervene in Syria until they are completely sure 
that Bashar al-Assad regime has used chemical weapons. At the same time, our country and media don't trust UN official reports, questioning which has been US influence in the tests carried in Syria. During this week, most articles and reports are carried either in Russia or the Western, and there are mostly discussions with specialists and politics that analyze what is the situation and what is the rest of the world responding to United States intentions. For example, today, Russia Today broadcast a discussion in cross-talking show on September 4 between two American journalists and a diplomat and discuss how unreliable the UN reports are and how important the decision to go to war or not is. On the other hand, some Russian journalists, mostly freelance, decided to stay in Syria during this week, even if the situation is more and more unstable. A frontline news agency named Anna News, whose slogan is Through the Explaining Facts, Facts Supporting Through, has freelance journalists on the ground that make a brief summary of the situation in Syria almost every day and try to tell what is actually happening in Damascus and other parts of Syria. For example, September 4th briefing reports few attacks perpetrated by both regime and militants with specific details on the weapons that they use and how many people die, and it is presented as a journal. While Russian main media focus their content on the U United States decision to intervene in Syria and the UN reports on chemical welfare, this frontline agency attempts to draw the picture of the real situation in Syria. I am Federica Marsi from Syria. Traditional media outlets are supporting President Bashar al-Assad, who denies having used chemical weapons and who clearly is against the US intervention. Rebel groups have set up new TV channels and newspapers to portray the atrocities of the war and gain international support. Intervention will determine life and death in Syria, but views on how this will impact on the ground are different. However, both sides present moral arguments as to how this will impact on Syria. On the 28th of August, Al Ba'ath, the newspaper of the ruling party, opened with the title, The US prepares to commit the crime of a new war against Syria. American analysts say Obama is a copy of Bush. In the article, Obama is described as the main character of an American film who considers himself entitled to draw a red line between what is admissible and what is not admissible. al Ba'ath argues that the US wants to intervene in order to avoid the UN investigation on chemical weapons that will dismiss American allegation of President Bashar al-Assad having used those weapons against his own people. Al Ba'ath also states that Kerry and his counterparts in Germany, France and Israel are liars. Opposition news outlets include TV station which broadcasts outside Syria and weekly newspapers and simple A4 um, handouts that are made and produced and distributed within Syria. One of these is the weekly newspaper produced by the opposition called Ain al-Baladi, which is produced in Daraya near Damascus. On the 25th of August, the newspaper titled Chemical Weapons and the Necessity for the International Community to Restore its Credibility. Here the criticism of the West is even sharper. The article states that the whole world will remember the shameful international silence towards the tragedy that is taking place and asks, for how long will the civilized world continue with its politics of the red line that allows dictatorship to kill thousands of citizens with weapons that are internationally banned? International politics, the article argues, takes decisions on the basis of interest and not of human and ethical principles. Clearly, Assad's paper portrays American intervention as a crime that will claim more lives, whereas the opposition is putting the, board, the burden of new casualties on the shoulder of it, the international community. Pan-Arab newspapers have generally been skeptical of US intervention. 
However, not all of them have taken a clear standpoint on this issue. Al Ahram, for instance, which is the newspaper published in Egypt and distributed all across the Middle East, has greeted the decision of some European countries not to intervene uh, in Syria with the US uh, with an article that titles End of an Era of American Bullying. The article expresses contempt for Obama's loss of influence, which makes him unable to play with the life and death as he did in Iraq in countries that he considers under his colonial sovereignty. Al-Sharq al instead, which is a pan-Arab newspaper published in London, gives more emphasis in its report to Bashar, of Bashar al-Assad, addressing him as a criminal. However, it is not straightforward in supporting or rejecting foreign intervention, but poses questions such as would an international strike on Syria and the Assad regime? After examining world powers media coverage in Syria during this time frame, the conclusion is clear. There was a wide range of media coverage showing the viewers the implications of an intervention or no intervention on both Syrians and journalists. Whether the coverage be how the intervention would play out in British politics, or whether it be the lives of American and French journalists or citizen journalists. Media from these great nations impacted the life and death of Syrians. Even Russian media showed a glimpse of their political standpoint on the implications intervention would have on the Syrian people. But no media coverage was quite like the Syrian media coverage on the ground, which showed truly how the Syrian conflict was impacting the lives and deaths of average citizens. Thank you for watching 20 Minutes. Until next time.